Um, so welcome everybody. Um, yeah, today we uh, got invited to talk about uh, the project uh, my brother and I are uh, doing. It is the uh, security knowledge framework. Uh, it's also free, of course. Uh, everything basically what OWASP does is uh, free and uh, yeah, ready to use for everybody. A um, <coughs> little bit more about me. I'm a <coughs> left guy, Glenn Tenkate, uh, working, doing security for more than 10 years. Uh, basically done a lot of hacking, pen testing, security research. Uh, was also in the beginning a coder by heart. Uh, yeah, so uh, we uh, have a lot of information to share and uh, we try to capture this information into the uh, security knowledge framework. Um, so today we're gonna talk about that. Uh, but first I want to create the right scene for you guys and uh, yeah, get some energy going and uh, excitement. Um, yeah, we want to start with, with you guys. Basically also the security knowledge framework that my brother <laughs> is gonna uh, show you guys later on, uh, a real demo. Uh, and yeah, basically the idea why did we start it, uh, the security knowledge framework. Um, we started it because we uh, wanted to help and empower you guys, the developers. Uh, and we make a lot of reference to the matrix because uh, we see you guys as Neo. The, the guy that, that can change reality and uh, alter the matrix, bend reality uh, in this uh, environment and be the hero. Because um, as far as we've seen it and based on experience, we really miss those type of neos in, in our real life uh, that making and creating a secure environment. Uh, like I said before, I've done a lot of hacking. Uh, my brother is also a hacker, a pen tester. Uh, and we see that, uh, yeah, over the past 10 years, nothing really uh, changed that much. Not as much as we would like to see it. There are still so many applications being built that are not secure by design, that are really easable hacking. And uh, yeah, you have a lot of interest and a lot of uh, hackers, people that's trying to get you or the information or uh, the functionality that is available in a specific application. Um, so we want to point to you guys. We want to uh, start with the root, the developer, the guy that's building awesome functionality, making uh, functionality uh, become reality and really usable, right? Um, and mm. we want to help you guys, empower you guys. Um, <clears throat> like I said before, why did we uh, start the whole project? It is because we saw, yeah, repeating issues. So we did a penetration test somewhere. And again, 90% uh, of all the findings were the same as all the other ones. And we keep and kept repeating ourselves like, yeah, you should do this, you should do uh, secure coding like that, escaping, stuff like that. Uh, a great example is, for example, cross-site scripting. I don't know uh, who of you uh, are all uh, developing. Cool. Uh, and who know, knows about what cross-site scripting is? Okay. Uh, that's That's... Biggest amount ever of the hands I ever seen. So that's a good thing. So then my next question is who knows how to mitigate this issue? How to prevent it? Okay, that's even the best amount I ever seen. Um, so the problem already arises here. A lot of people know what it is, but don't really know how to properly uh, yeah, mitigate this uh, type very easy <laughs> vulnerability, right? Cross-site scripting. Uh, OWASP have some awesome logos uh, and uh, stickers you can uh, get, like uh, fighting cross-site scripting since 2001. Uh, I mean, come on, 2001, we still did not attack and, and mitigated this issue. It's still happening again. Even in the frameworks you can use, like the XHP, that will, based on the context where user input is uh, located, will escape it for you. Even there, in a, in a framework like that, in a library like that, there are still edge cases, edge cases that still can introduce cross-site scripting. So we're still fighting against this type of vulnerability. And it's not only about cross-site scripting, it's about around 170 security controls you should implement. And cross-site scripting is only one of those. Uh, so again, we are f in front of a big challenge here, uh, especially you guys as a developer to be aware of all the, these uh, type of issues that can occur when creating a, an application. <coughs> so, like I said, we had a lot of deja vu's. 
and uh, yeah, we, we saw that everybody uh, should have a good place, a reference, a central place where they can get this information and be aware upfront, have this knowledge and yeah, use it to, to make a secure uh, application. <coughs> uh, like I said, a lot of developers are just like the, the beginning phase of NEO, really barely hanging on. Like, like here, Neo is trying to dodge bullets and still got hit. He tries his best, but still it's not good enough, right? He needs to be trained, he needs to be aware, he needs to be chosen to, to go to the right path and walk the path. And um, yeah, basically because of this, we saw a lot of people struggling with security and with issues. Uh, so we, we created the, the security knowledge framework. Um, and like I said, there is luckily always an option. Uh, OWASP did already a great part in this, trying to create a security awareness amongst the developer, amongst the board, amongst management, uh, in businesses. Uh, but still, we felt that there was still a huge category, a huge persons left behind. And that's basically, yeah, the root. You guys, the developers, the programmers. I mean, it's cool that you can, after you created an application, you can run tooling against it to get out of, hey, you have th these type of vulnerabilities like cross-site scripting of SQL injection. But still, it's an after effect thing. And if you try to, to fix it, then basically you're not doing security by design. You're trying to slap on security afterwards. Uh, and, and based from experience, you always get a hacky, shitty solution to be honest, and uh, still that leaves a lot of room for uh, implementation errors. Uh, also think about the, uh, the project uh, that needs to be delivered on a certain time. You will not make that if you don't take uh, security into consideration. Um, and like I said, there are always uh, uh, means to learn. Uh, the OWASP site itself has a, a lot of information there, um, but still we thought this is it can do be better, it, it can be easier, uh, lower uh, 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 opportunity to get easier to this specific information that you need. So that's basically why we created the security knowledge framework, to have a central place that's really transparent, all the information, knowledge base items, code examples, they are all on the GitHub, so uh, everybody can see it, contribute, you see what has changed, why, uh, there's really an in-depth uh, yeah, access for everybody to, to use this. Um, so, a little bit uh, about OWASP for the people who don't know yet. Uh, like I said, uh, uh, it's a worldwide non-profit charitable, so uh, yeah, everything is uh, free. And uh, like the, the slide says, uh, the mission is to make software security visible so that individuals and organizations worldwide can make informed decisions uh, about true uh, software security risk. Um, and it is already hard to, to, to do this. So we try uh, and much of possible ways to, to help and uh, aid you guys in uh, making the right decisions. Uh, and like I said, it, it's all starting with you. You guys as a developer that, you know, taking the right uh, choice. In this case, Neo that takes the right pill to, to know the truth. Uh, and for you guys, it's basically the same. Be really responsible for your code and also, yeah, what you develop. I mean, if you are in the, the real world working for a company that you need to deliver some certain project or code or functionality, you have a really short time span and, and time window to build this. There will be a lot of pressure. Uh, sometimes they will even say to you, forget about security. Uh, so. I just want to give you uh, yeah, the possibility, the choice that you guys have to say, no, I'm not going to do it like this. I need more time. I need to do this securely by design. And it's really your guys' choice to go with this flow or take the blue pill and forget about it. <laughs> uh, um, so, of course, it's also important to uh, test your code and uh, yeah, to have a, a sort of a standard. Uh, in here, OWASP uh, plays again a very significant role uh, because, like you see here, the uh, ASVS, that's a project again from the OWASP, uh, from uh, other project leaders, um, and it stands for the Application Security Verification Standard. Um, 
as you can see, it's divided in different levels. Uh, so yeah, level one, opportunistic, when you really want to, well, have a simple static website and you want to start implementing and doing security by design. The level two is more the standard. So if you're creating a football, soccer, club, website or something, and the level three, that's the most advanced level that you uh, really want to apply on yeah, critical applications. Critical applications that maybe can open the dikes or uh, control some energy grids or stuff like that. Um, and the AASVS really helps you uh, giving a set of security requirements upfront where you need to comply to. Because as the name already says, it is the application security verification standard. So this checklist you also use after you created all the code to do the verification that you not missed one of the security controls. And like I uh, said in the beginning, uh, the level three consists of uh, around 170 security controls you need to implement. Uh, my brother, the, uh, he will uh, go through the demo later on, show you how it will look like, what type of categories, um, yeah, and how you can use this in, in your project and in the designing phase. Um, uh, because, yeah, again, we see a lot of projects starting with no security requirements up front that will lead to really big structural issues. Uh, the possibility, of course, that your application can be hacked, but also uh, the possibility that your project will be ended because of all these structural issues. Uh, myself as a hacker uh, killed a lot of pilot versions. Uh, those pilots were very costly. Uh, and in the end of the, the whole chain, the whole project, they came to the conclusion, holy F, there are so many structural issues, we can basically drop it in the bin, start over again, because yeah, this is no point in fixing. So keep in mind, when you are building an application, always use the security requirements in one type of form. It could be the level one, based on your risk assessment, or if you have really critical applications, go for the level three. The whole idea is, of course, that uh, the blind <laughs> now can see. They know wh what to expect. They know what is coming on them, what they are uh, yeah, needed to, to implement in their project and consider uh, yeah, as a, uh, an extra layer. I mean, doing your application really secure by design, uh, yeah, it, it makes so much more easier and fun into the whole development and programming. It's not only about uh yeah being safe but it's also about ego about passion about look at my code it's it's proactive it's defensible right no hacker or an agent can surprise me in this case <laughs> um so i want to talk a little bit uh, about the security knowledge framework uh, in short skf um like i said we, we build it uh, for basically to have a, a guide for secure programming to to help uh, the developer in making a correct security design up front uh, and yeah, incorporate all the security controls in there. So like I said before, you don't want to slap it on afterwards because that will be a hacky and a, a not good high quality end result. It's also about the security awareness. Uh, we have different phases in the project. Um, so the first phase, that is basically the pre-development. And there we try to generate and create the awareness for the developer when creating certain type of functionality. Um, yeah, and like I said before, clear and transparent. So everything is on GitHub. You can find it, uh, all the information there that we use in the project itself. You can spin it up yourself locally on your laptop. You can deploy it in the ISVS uh, service, for example, if you want to have it uh, more broader uh, for everybody. Um, there are a lot of possibilities and also you get the information on the spot. So if you need guidance, you need help with a certain functionality or category, you can use the security knowledge framework, search for it and it will give you the feedback. Um, so now I hand it over to my brother. He will uh, give a, a demo of the security knowledge framework. Uh, after the demo, we're going to take a, a short break so uh, it can sink in a little bit. And after the, the, uh, the, the break, we're going to talk a little bit more about software development lifecycle and uh, the different quality gates in that whole chain uh, that also help you as a developer create a really good quality product.
So, hello, I'm the brother. <laughs> My name is uh, Ricardo. So I'm going to do a little demonstration about security knowledge framework itself. So this demo is also available for you online. So if you want to check it out after the talk, you can uh, go to securebyte.design. <laughs> uh, you can find our website with all information, documentation, installation guides, uh, uh, how does SKF work, a little in-depth uh, uh, training videos and telling you uh, uh, what the framework is and what it is about and how it works. So that would be a good reference. Um, yeah, so first I want to show you guys the knowledge base. It's a little blurry. Hmm. Can you guys all read what it says? Okay, that's a bummer. <coughs> uh, no, well, just for context, these are all security controls which you want to apply on your application in order to enforce a high level of security. So as you can see, you may not be reading them, but those are a lot. So imagine me typing file upload injections. Uh, here we get a, a, a description about what is a file upload injection, uh, what is an attacker's attack vector whenever he can upload malicious files to your application, uh, as well as solutions. Okay, what am I going to do in my code uh, to mitigate this type of attack to ensure attackers cannot upload malicious files to my server and if they can how to sandbox them properly so that is the knowledge base um, it's a bit bummery because i can't show you the code examples now maybe if i zoom in a little bit yes okay good to know for later so now we're starting a new project What this says doesn't really matter. It's about uh, the idea. So we created, uh, like we said before, we, we uh, uh, split up the whole development process in two different stages, your pre-development, your post-development. In your pre-development, you, you want to have a general idea of what type of uh, vulnerabilities the functionality you are building uh, can bring with it. So let's say, for instance, your boss comes at you and says, yeah, I want to have a file download function. And I also want to have a file upload function. Oh yeah, and I want to do something with password forget. Now we add the values. <laughs> uh, this is uh, when you start a new sprint, like I, we said before, now with this, this correlates, correlates directly back to the database, to the knowledge base and gives you uh, yeah, an understanding of what your pitfalls might be when building these type of functionalities. So you can see whenever you're bu building a file upload functionality, there can be file upload injections. Whenever you are building a file download functionality, there can be reflective file download and file download injections. Whenever you are building a password forget function, as you can see here, this is more of a pattern and uh, this item consists several knowledge base items which you have to take into consideration when building a password forget function. Uh, for instance, you have to uh, uh, take into, the co into consideration the entropy of your uh, uh, tokens which, which are being sent to your email. Uh, you never show a user a plain text password. So sometimes you have an application and you do, okay, I want to do a password forget. It shows you an email with your new password plain text. Okay, you don't want to do that. That is bad practice. So um, yeah, basically that is what we're telling here, you here, uh, uh, the steps to take when building something as a password forget function. So now, uh, yeah, when you, you filled in the, the pre-development form, you have the understanding, you know what to do and how to mitigate uh, certain types of vulnerability in your code before you even wrote a single line of code. Um, if that does not give you enough context to truly understand uh, uh, what, you are, what, what is expected from you to do in order to mitigate, <coughs> we also have, you probably can read it, code examples. 
now it starts to get a little messy because basically we all know a file upload functionality you can write in, there in, in like five lines of code and then you have a fully functional file upload function you don't want to do that a good file upload functionality as you can see takes a little more than five lines of code because uh, you want to do a, a check on the mime type but not in the post request but because if a hacker has an intercepting proxy he can uh, uh, temper the value from the mime type in the post request you want to check on file extensions but you do, do not want to randomly check on a file extension because if an, a a an attacker would upload .png.php it would uh, uh, get through your uh, regular expression functionality and you can, st you can still upload this web shell. So uh, yeah, a couple of things to take into consideration when building your file upload functionality. Like I said, you could do it in five lines of code, but that's not the way to go. Um, let's see, another good type of example would be, oh wait, this one is prettier. The HTML output, like we discussed before, uh, which one of you guys knew how to mitigate the cross-site scripting attack? Okay, cool. Do you al also know all the different types and contexts in which a cross-site scripting could exist? And what type of context? Because you have your standard uh, uh, HTML uh, encoding for your escaping, like you can see here, for your classical attack. Maybe I should zoom it in a little. <coughs> yeah. So your classical cross-site scripting attack. Uh, for PHP, if you do your uh, HTML uh, special characters, you escape this function. All the meta characters will be properly encoded. XSS <coughs> does not exist no more. But whenever user input uh, uh, gets into an HTML attribute, this will be enough and your standard escaping would is not sufficient anymore you still got xss so you apply html attribute encoding but there is more we also have to have javascript string encoding so if you pass uh, um, variables let's say from your view back directly to uh, javascript functions we still have xss but wait there is more if you make an, uh, 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 a user of your web application fill in the sort of a website or something, he, could st he can still inject JavaScript alert, and you would still have XSS. So uh, context uh, uh, in escaping and mitigating is very, very important. So uh, yeah, basically that's why we built SKF, because like we said, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed person is the king. We want to make you the one-eyed person so you know what to do. So that is basically pre-development. We also have post-development. And in post-development, like we mentioned before, we have the ASVS <coughs> checklist the application security verification standard checklist. Uh, like we told before, the, these checklists come in three different levels. And uh, just for the fun of it, I'll show you level three. Nope. Yes. As you can see, we have architecture, design and threat modeling, authentication verification requirements, we have session management verification requirements, access control verification requirements, etc., and so forth and so on. On and about 170 security controls you want to implement in your code in order to enforce a high level of security. So when you're starting to build very critical applications, this is what you need. This is what you must uh, uh, implement in your code in order to keep attackers out. Uh, also very important what we do in SKF, like my brother al already said before, we want to teach in our code examples and uh, with, with our description solutions the really paranoid programming approach. 
like um, make your application proactive. For instance, let's say you have a, you have a form and your form contains a drop down menu menu with, with a fixed subset of values. You might want to whitelist those values. Whenever a user uh, sends that form and you get a value back from that form, which uh, is out of the intended operation of your application, you punish that user. You keep a counter if he does it too often. You throw him out because the only uh, um, the only way he can send you a different value is he being in between your application with an intercepting proxy, tempering those values and trying to hack your application. Same goes for something like a checkbox or a radio button. Uh, yeah, I think you, you should make your application proactive, detect those types of attacks, uh, reject that user input, and if possible, keep a counter and kick that user out of your application because he's trying to hack you. Save checklist, yes. So again, for each uh, checklist item, is correlated back to the knowledge base and gives you a little bit more in-depth information about what you should do in order to mitigate uh, failed checklist items. As you can see, those are a lot. Uh, yeah. Also, if you want to use SKF as a service in your organization, we also have user management. You can create new users. Those users can be uh, attached to groups. These groups can be attached to projects. And um, yeah, so you can use it as a service with your development team and you can assign projects to developers, share and uh, um, yeah, see what, it, what there is to do for your security. So here, yeah. It's Bad readable, I will skip this. So basically that is uh, what the security knowledge framework is uh, all about in a nutshell. We'll be switching back. Um, yeah, I wanted to add uh, one little bit more. Um, so um, I'm a, uh, uh, well, a lot of people are al already using it. We also do a lot of uh, workshops to, uh, to show people how to do it. So basically we try to empower the developer and give him uh, the knowledge up front and this whole framework to do a proper assessment and see what security controls needs to be implemented. Uh, what I also do is um, together with the developer team, they filled in the post development phase as my brother uh, already showed. Um, the thing is that when you have the, uh, the checklist, you can um, uh, select uh, the different type of controls. So uh, what I normally do is let the developers itself fill in this checklist, say like, uh, yes, we implemented it, this type of security control, or no, we didn't. So then we, we leave it. Um, and of course, some items are not applicable because it's a microservice or it's an API or whatever could not be in there, not needed. Um, there's also an information here. It's badly re written. Bigger. It gives a little bit more information and context about the security control you're trying to, uh, yeah, to verify. Um, then what we do is, well, like Ricardo showed, you submit it and every item that is selected no will be correlated against one of the uh, knowledge base items to give you more in-depth knowledge. Then the developers have uh, sometimes a huge list of uh, missing security controls. So they go back to the drawing table, write the code, maybe rewrite the whole project if they missed a lot. Uh, that can also happen, of course. Um, and after that, what, we all, uh, what I like to do always is going to sit in a room with the developers, me behind the checklist and on the Beamer, the code of the project. Then we go from every item on this checklist, we go on the implementation level and we check every security control. And the problem, and I will talk a little bit more later, is uh, yeah, why aren't security tooling doing this correctly? Uh, because they really lack context. They lack context and 
we try to solve it together with the developers in one room, with the code on the beamer, me as the attack attacker with the attack factors, the attacking mind, the how can I ab abuse this type of functionality and really uh, do a sort of, uh, yeah, uh, extreme programming approach, a sort of, uh, you know, helping each other, sharing knowledge and, and make, make each other a better, you know, uh, programmer, a better hacker or um, and it also creates a lot of uh, team team uh, spirit and synergy and again it's all about sharing the knowledge and, and using each other's knowledge to, to become better and write and create better quality products. Uh, and what I also wanted to show is, uh, well, like Ricardo said, that is why we created the code examples is because we did find out that when you know, you only have a generic message like, yeah, you should check this or that. It, 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 sometimes it's not enough. You really want to see on an implementation level how it's done, what the approach should be. Um, and like Ricardo also said, we really like the paranoid mindset where you have the, the, the application becoming defensive on its own, using the counters, punishing users when they input strange or wrong uh, uh, values in the in the parameters um, so what we also did is we are now building the uh, having the PHP and the .NET examples uh, we are busy building Java examples uh, another friend is busy building the Python examples so the the code examples will be uh, yeah bigger and, and grow on time uh, it takes a lot of energy and effort so uh, yeah we're still really busy with that um, yeah, and that's basically how, how the security knowledge framework can help you guys in yeah, creating the right choices, getting the right approach, and uh, well, teaching about the code principles. Because for example, when we go back to the code uh, examples, um, and we take a nice one like, um, user controls, maybe that's a good one. Um, we really want to uh, create the right mindset, like that you have the first log everything. Before you start running a function, you log the, log the function saying, hey, this user, this timestamp, this IP address is going to use this, it's going to start this type of functionality. Uh, and then also the level of uh, impact, so low, medium, high. So for example, if you have a login uh, functionality that's gonna be triggered by a user, that's a high impacting functionality because if there is an, uh, an, a vulnerability in there, it's really freaking dangerous that an attacker can abuse this and maybe impersonate another user in a database by, for example, uh, database uh, column uh, uh, truncation injection, for example, where you can mimic another user that exists in a database. So these type of functionality, you really want to score high. And then you say, well, like, yeah, why do I log this? Well, those metrics you can then use in your application itself to make defensible uh, yeah, actions, right? If a user hits too many times a high uh, functionality that, you know, in a wrong manner, then you punish him, destroy the session, lock the guy out from your application, maybe tar pitting him or whatever, right? depending on what you want to achieve. <coughs> um, then when you did uh, the logging and you start the function, then like the bro my brother said, you do the validation, strict validation. If the validation fails, you log that again, you increase the counter. Uh, and well, with a login functionality, you set immediately the counter to three uh, and then you kick the user already out. Well, yeah, of course. Yeah, so like I said, in this example, if you would now go to the demo and you try some injections, in our case, we choose to do, go to the maximum paranoid stuff mm -hmm. and the whole application stops working for everybody. Because in some critical applications, you first want to do your analysis, you first want to check all the things and then boot it up again. So not, I mean, maybe the application is really owned and it is that critical, you really want to immediately proactive disable the whole thing. In some cases, <coughs> some web applications, 
I agree, you don't want to do this. Uh, depending on yeah, context again, what you like to choose. But the idea is just to make you guys aware that with those auditing and logging and all those validation encounters, you can proactively from your application do mitigations against the attacker. Um, like I said, when you first do the logging, then you call the function, you do the validation. If the validation doesn't fi uh, fit right, if, if it fails, you log it and you increase the counter. After you've done the validation and uh, well, basically really do input uh, rejection. So if it doesn't comply on what you explicitly expect, you even deny the, the whole input, you reject it and don't try to, to process it in a manner that it could be used. No, it's just not good, retry. If you have three times, you're banned, you're, you're out. <laughs> Um, again, then you did your functionality. Mm -hmm. if, if the happy flow is uh, good, right? You do the function and then after the function, before it's, it's done, you call again a log message. This function, this user was successfully uh, finished and uh, okay, no issue there. Because why would somebody want to do this? Why not only log once and then leave it like that? Why do you really want to do a, a two-step logging mechanism for every function? Anybody an idea maybe? <laughs> no? Because what can happen if you only do the logging in the beginning part of your functionality, you don't know what the outcome can be. If I am a hacker and I successfully miss abu or abuse your file upload functionality, you don't have any result of that, that I was successful or not. It will be completely blank darkness for you what happened there and if you do it both ways on two spots the beginning and the end you have the full cycle and you can do a proper risk analysis saying hey this time that logging didn't occur so something is really going on something weird um, so multiple steps uh, really yeah the, the the defensible coding approach uh, and using all those metrics you, you uh, generate in every function to make your application proactive. Uh, yeah. So I think uh, this is uh, good for now. We do a, a small break, get a cigarette or something, coffee maybe, uh, and then we continue later with the, uh, yeah, the whole development life cycle and uh, the different quality gates we want to uh, also have there. See you in a bit. So welcome back everybody. Um, like I said, uh, there is a, a second part where we want to uh, highlight the software development life cycle. Uh, again, uh, security is part of a, a quality gate. Um, yeah, and the more quality gates that you as a developer can, uh, well, uh, you know, gain a lot of time and uh, with every release you're gonna do, have the, that type of quality in your product. Um, so let's continue the, uh, the, yeah, the presentation. Um, yeah, so with all this information, with all this tooling, the security knowledge framework, the security requirements, the security awareness, the specific information on the spot and the verification step, you now have all this knowledge. You, you know this now, you are ready to build cool, secure applications by design. Um, uh, but like I said, it, it's not only that, it, it continues. Uh, there are still, uh, when you set up a software development life cycle or basically a pipeline where your application will be built, tested and go through all the quality gates, uh, there's still a manual part and there will be a context integration part. I first want to uh, explain a little bit about the manual part. Like I showed you guys uh, the security knowledge framework uh, why does it give you so much correct and good feedback? Because we have context. It is not a tool that will try to be smart for you uh, that I will explain a little bit later. So still it's a manual step. It is taking a couple of integrations for yourself as a developer to get to use and know all the security controls you need to implement. But I can guarantee you guys, if you do it a couple of times, it will be your nature. It will be you know, you never ever want to build an application insecure anymore. It is so nice. Um, 
setting up the software development lifecycle. Uh, yeah, that's the manual part. You have to configure it, you have to uh, build it. Um, so there's no escape from that. Uh, doing a code review. So again, if you have critical functionality, like I explained before, uh, the user registration, for example, or the user login uh, part, um, that high uh, critical functionality, you definitely want to code review that uh, by a colleague or something, or a pen test or a security guy. If you have them in your team, it would be awesome. If not, then give your senior guy uh, the code and say, hey, is this a good thing that I didn't he did here? And uh, well, he can basically give you feedback, maybe on the functional level, maybe he's a very skilled security guy, so he can also give you pointers on possible attack factors that you may have introduced when creating certain type of code. Um, so that part is also still a manual thing you have to do. Of course, you could build a, a piece of continuous integration tooling that will highlight only the critical parts where you have the high uh, type of classification, like I, uh, I, sh I t talked about before, when you do the logging, uh, where you say, hey, this type of uh, uh, yeah, risk is high, medium, or low. You can use that as an indicator of what type of code really needs to get a code audit uh, to make sure no vulnerabilities uh, are introduced on an implementation level. Um, then we have the SOST and the DOST. Um, those are basically, I will start with the first one, SOST, the static analysis, analyzing tooling, security tooling. Uh, so that are the, uh, the code analyzers that were specifically check on every type of uh, vulnerabilities that can occur in your code. Uh, it is a manual thing. I mean, you fire the thing up, here's my code, go scan it. But still, all the outcome, all the false positives, you have go to, to go through them all to see if it's a valid finding or not, and uh, if it's a valid finding, how to mitigate this type of issue. It's still a lot of work, it's a manual thing. Um, yeah, you can kick off the, the scanning, automate it with every requ pull request, for example, but still you have to do it manually. Um, the same for the, the DOST, you can, uh, that's the dynamic application security tooling. So that means when you are creating a web application, you are testing it not on the code level, but you're testing it dynamically. So when it's spinned up the final product and really on an application level, try to inject and, and yeah, find vulnerabilities. Um, now, an interesting thing is you may be asking yourself, so why is there SKF when we have a SOST and a DOST? I mean, should they be able already to f help you, guide you and find all security issues? Well, I found out that um, a lot of these tooling can only really do uh, a minimum, yeah, um, really basic stuff. So the obvious cross-site scripting Ricardo showed, like when you have a script injection and it's reflected in your HTML page, yeah, it, it will find that. But all the attributes, all the uh, yeah, obfuscated in JavaScript user input, it will probably not find it. The edge case, when you have the href and you have the user uh, controlling the URL that can be placed in there, uh, no uh, static code analyzer will check if it's allowed to put there JavaScript double point and then the injection. So still there are a lot of edge cases. The SOST and the DOST cannot simply find. And especially with, with uh, the SOST, it's also specific to only work for certain type of languages. So there are maybe very well certain products to do PHP scanning, but hey, if you're a hipster, you're not programming in PHP, you'll build Go web applications. Well, then you already <laughs> have a problem because that language is not supported by the static code analyzer. Um, also, what I found out that a lot of tooling only in some cases they do more, but in most cases they only do the OWASP top 10. Probably you heard of it before. That is an, uh, a pa paper OWASP releases. Uh, it should be every year, but we found out that there is not really that much changing. So uh, yeah, it's a static uh, top 10 list of most used uh, and seen vulnerabilities uh, in the world that websites uh, and businesses uh, get attacked from. 
and uh, like uh, the cross site scripting, SQL injection, uh, think about the cross site guest forgery uh, attacks. Those are all on the top 10 list. Um, so they are really focused on only finding the top 10. And uh, you will agree with me that, well, seeing the security knowledge framework with the 170 security controls, a top 10 isn't enough. It is a nice indication of uh, the level of security and you know where you stand, but you need to do more. And we think that with uh, yeah those type of tooling, of course, I would everybody say use them if you have the capability, uh, because they are a sort of a low hanging fruit, uh, yeah safety check quality gate. Um, but again, I would not trust my life on it. I would trust my life on all you guys. Remember the neos, the 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 guys that have the potential to really alter and change the, the reality we're living in and really stopping all those type of attacks. So I want to give you the knowledge and the information you need, not a tool that does it for you. Because yeah, that's pointless. You won't learn, you will make the same mistakes and we don't want that, right? So um, manual stuff you still have to do, uh, but there's also a good thing. There's also continuous integration. Uh, of course, we want to continuously integrate the security knowledge framework as a security requirement, pre-development, post-development, uh, verification. But there are also other ways, other tooling out there that can help you in creating quality. Um, like I said, security is a part of a quality. Um, but just as the functionality of your product is a quality, the maintainability of your project is quality. They're all quality aspects that come into play when creating a, a project. <coughs> um, and for example, uh, well, everything what, what we preach here, we also do in the security knowledge framework. So we set also up for the project itself that's hosted on GitHub, uh, three uh, continuous integration quality gates. Uh, basically the, the first one that is Travis, that is a, a build platform that you can use to uh, for every pull request we do. It will pull in the new request install all the dependencies that's needed for running the security knowledge framework and then try to set up the project again to see if there's no syntax errors or strange behavior that could have been introduced with the new commit of a contributor. Uh, then when that's all successfully, we go to the next integration tooling, uh, the next quality gate, basically coveralls. And coveralls, that's you, uh, showing and making all the unit tests we do to keep the functionality uh, and check that uh, and, and show that uh, and give a feedback to the developer saying, hey, the code you have committed to is still okay and it didn't break any functionality. Very important, of course, because again, you don't want to every release and especially in a DevOps agile way of programming, you want to manually be like a monkey and, and test all the functionality. No, that's insane. If, especially if you have like 10 or 100 releases a day, your job will be shitty, right? If you only are a monkey testing stuff. That can all be automated with a continuous integration uh, manner. And we use coveralls to display the metrics of the output of the unit test. And then the last part is the scrutinizer. Scrutinizer is a code quality tool. Um, so it's not gonna check your code for injections and all that stuff. Because yeah, like I said before, uh, I just thought like that's an insane uh, issue because the uh, SAS tooling has not enough context. Only you as the builder of your project have all the context, right? So we don't want to go that way, but we do want to know what the quality is of the code of the developer that has been pushed. Uh, and what do we check on there? We check, for example, on uh, dead end code that can be introduced because there is a new function that makes some other code obsolete. <laughs> So you have dead end code in your, in your uh, application. Um, that results into a higher complexity and that means that the quality of the product is lower, right? Uh, another thing that the scrutinizer will check for is uh, complex if, else, then, whatever statements, because again, it makes the code very complex, so harder to maintain. Harder to maintain means, uh, yeah, better, not, not that good quality, right? Um, 
another thing is the complexity and the uh, yeah the, the longness of the lines of code so is your function very short compact uh, or is it 300 lines I mean again it's all have to do with uh, maintainability and the quality of your code um, so like I said before we have the uh, uh, on the github we have all the information and we also use this um, so if I now go back to uh, our github um, yeah like I said everything is on the github maybe I zoom it in a bit um, you can see over here the project status details um, and what it means is uh, every time we we ourselves pushing something into the uh, master github or anybody else like you guys adding a piece of uh, code or whatever it will kick off all those three uh, continuous integration tooling um, and for example we have here a pull request um, by Adam Fish really cool guy uh, he saw a bug in our uh, project and um, he, fi he fixed it so what happened when he did the pull request immediately github saw like oh there's a new pool i'm gonna initialize <laughs> the scrutinizer and gonna uh, run the continuous integration on the travis and it takes about two and a half minutes to get this feedback back to the developer saying hey dude your code your commit was awesome because it did not break the project uh, second we tested all the functionality and all the functionality was still working as expected uh, and third we did also the code quality check and uh, the grade didn't drop down um, so with this we have a, a complete overview uh, what has changed if it's still intact and based on well the details we can now easily say okay we're going to merge this pull request because all is still working so it takes a lot of effort and time out of our hands to verify and go through the whole process each and every time somebody does a commit or you know uh, contribute something um, so here you can see the uh, the example of uh, the uh, Travis uh, output um, so Adam Fisher in this case he created a, a commit it ran about 2.54 seconds we test for Python version 2.6 and 2.7 and we can then click to see what is the uh, the output being generated um, by this uh, uh, pull request so as you can see in here the, the above one uh, it pulls in the new uh, pull request from the github with the change that he made uh, then we spin up the, the correct uh, settings dependencies so as you can see here we install the OLS SKF from pip because that contains all the dependencies for the project uh, then we install the pytest coverage tool uh, the coverage tool itself <coughs> to push it later on to the coverall uh, continuous integration service to display all the metrics and then basically the final test is to set up and test the project to see if it's still building correctly as we want to uh, if somewhere in the process it will give an exit code uh, then Travis will give the badge I shown before uh, this one it will say uh, build failing a big red uh, <laughs> uh, badge will be shown like yeah no sorry you broke something so in a real short amount you get the feedback you need to see hey did I break something was the good quality uh, that I pushed and is the project still uh, being correct um, so when there is no exit code from Travis it will continue and it will run the coverage uh, testing basically the unit testing of all the functionality we have and try to see if we get the expected result that we yeah, are expecting right um, so in this case it runs a lot of uh, uh, unit tests in this case 17 of them uh, and well if there is no failure in here it goes well the build passing uh, at last there is a coveralls and uh, coveralls will grab the metrics push them from Travis to the uh, coverall surface and display the metrics there so when we have a look over here um, this is how the uh, coveralls uh, application looks like um, yeah, still readable I hope so 
so in one uh, view you can see how many uh, unit tests are being triggered uh, what the coverage is of the project who made the last commit and what the coverage exam uh, averages and percentages of this uh, pull request and again you have a very short feedback loop saying to the developer hey dude you have created awesome code it didn't break anything we can still build it and the coverage the, of the unit test is still stable uh, it shouldn't drop down right because that means there is new functionality being created where no unit tests are written for for example or he made an, uh, <coughs> an uh, adjustment to the code that will break functionality so this way it's all being done automatically for us and test the quality uh, of the project <coughs> and um, like I said at last <coughs> there is an, uh, an uh, yeah, scrutinizer uh, that will uh, check the code quality of the project so again dead-end code complex code uh, long uh, uh, complex code it's all being checked so again in one eye in one overview we can see oh this code that has now been pushed by this uh, contributor uh, well he wasn't a good programmer for example so the grade downgraded so it became a six or uh, lower so we can see hey here we need to have a look at because yeah this is not the quality we want to achieve it should go up or be stable but never go down right um, so again with this all those uh, uh, implementations of the contest integration uh, it will help again and take away a lot of time from the developer that he normally had to do I mean if I would do this on a Monday uh, and I had to do it manually I will make mistakes I can already say up front uh, yeah I'm human this is automated it will not make mistakes uh, at least if I program it correctly but hey don't program it on Monday I would say um, so again um, they get the, the Im immediately feedback and the feedback loop is very uh, close also with like the ZOS and DOS tooling the feedback loop can be very immense uh, high right some some uh, web application scanners take days to if you have really have a big application it will take days to run the full test to run the full cycle and then give you the feedback yeah that you really wanted to know up front already <laughs> um, so again it's really about giving the feedback loop and uh, giving you the knowledge you need to know the same with the security knowledge framework you can you know query it on the spot get the feedback you need and well have a really short feedback loop uh, that was the whole goal with empowering you guys with the knowledge so you yeah don't are relying on a SOS or DOS tooling only right like I said it's a good addition but you shouldn't rely on that you should rely on your own the knowledge you have and yeah with you uh, there's a higher percentage of quality to 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 get um, than with the tooling um, <coughs> like I said before there's uh, all the information is uh, uh, in the github so also uh, about the Travis so how would you set up something uh, like we did before uh, and the Comtis integration well if you have open source projects you can use all those uh, Comtis integration tooling for free so you can get a free Travis account you can get a free coveralls account you can get a free scrutinizer account so if you have open source projects you can hook them up and you benefit from the same quality gates as the security knowledge framework does and setting it up is fairly easy as you can show here it's just defining the language if you need sudo or not uh, well in this case we want python we want those type of versions um, we do some pip installation for dependencies uh, we pull in the the master flask um, yeah framework and the coveralls then we have the scripts where we run the setup to see if it's still working uh, then we do the uh, coveralls we run it then we do it again for pushing it the results to the coveralls so basically with a simple uh, travis.yaml file you can already uh, use these type of integration for yourself and um, like i said before everybody who forks this project will benefit from the same continuous integration tooling like uh, this contributor 
he also got his own Travis instance and it's all automated by this uh, services get his own Travis build his uh, pull request on it runs all the tests runs all the unit tests push all the metrics and uh, in here we have the overview of well what it has been passed uh, and whatnot um, so again it's not only tooling uh, uh, we as the main uh, project uh, owners have it's somebody for everybody so every contributor when he does a pull request this continuous integration uh, cycle will kick in and yeah everybody will benefit from yeah the automation and the magic um, so like I said before uh, all the information uh, we have uh, and the whole project itself it's all on uh, on the github so there are no hidden knowledge base where you cannot reach or everything is open here and transparent um, and we made the choice to make it a markdown format so the checklist the code example the knowledge base items <coughs> they are all uh, in markdown format so if you click on it it will well beautifully <laughs> show it also in here uh, setting it up is also pretty easy this is how the markdown file look like so you can also easily reuse it reintegrate read it change it so even people with no python or f python flask in this case experience could still contribute to our project right so when you are designing projects you could also take this type of things into consideration to make it really easy for people to add value to it uh, because yeah the security knowledge framework it is not only for me and my brother but uh, or all of us but it's for everybody right to improve it every day uh, to make it better and and well so we can all benefit from it and the easier it is the better it would be and uh, yeah the more quality it would get uh, and again the same thing applies for the knowledge base items so every knowledge base item uh, is also in markdown format so if you see typos or whatever uh, it's easy adjustable you don't have to know anything about databases or programming language you can just chip in and help us uh, uh, improve it um, like I also said there are uh, many people helping out um, we have the uh, detailed information about um, how to set things up that's also a thing I wanted to show you um, we have the uh, readme.io again this is a service if you have an open source project you can use it for free um, and basically it is a nice place to have a uh, really styled nice way of documenting things um, oh. so again how to install certain type of things um, we do also have a chef cookbook uh, that's basically uh, well you have chef puppet ansible they're all like uh, cookbooks where you can really define how your uh, server in this case look like what application should be installed uh, and with that you can easily always spin up an environment exactly the way as intended uh, so it's more like a desired state uh, application that you always have uh, the same configuration the same settings with every deploy you do um, so again if you want to use it it's very easy you need virtual box in this case chef development kit and the vagrant this is what you need to do they get the master unzip it say day to it kitchen converge default and watch the magic happen and in five minutes you have a virtual box spin up with the skf project inside ready to work with all the settings in there so yeah again easy automation for the win right um, there also uh, a tutorial how to do the whole installation in the AWS environment uh, this is something um, uh, again um, uh, Adam Fish has uh, ed uh, edit and, and gave and helped with so uh, here's the whole template how to achieve the same thing inside the uh, yeah the AWS uh, 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 environment right um, it, it, it's a little bit the same like a chef cookbook only now you use a specific cloud provider to deploy it on um, we also have um, on the readme uh, website 
we have a support page where you can ask questions or if you stuck with certain uh, things like you can see here hey you got an internal server error i got permissions error how to set up on debian you know we try to help and and give pointers to people and maybe there is a feedback that we uh, really need to implement in the setup of the project so we we take that and uh, use it um, and again all the information about uh, the first run how to set it up how to create the admin account uh, because we do not set a default password because that's one of the items of the security knowledge framework and the uh, ISVS so there is a way how to set up a proper password for the admin so it's not default um, there, there's information now about projects, how to use them, what the idea behind it is uh, with decent screenshots. So this can be a, a good reference for you guys when to set it up and want to use it uh, for yourself or in your organization. Um, let's see. Yeah, uh, there are also a part um, that briefly we showed you guys and it was about custom checklists. So in the post development, there's also a, a, a place where you can add your own checklist. So these pages will describe how the, uh, the yeah, it's build, build up. So again, you don't have to write any code. It's just naming convention uh, of the file names and uh, you can hook them up into the security knowledge framework. Um, let's see. <coughs> so, um, yeah, that, that was the, uh, the, the getter part. Um, yeah, and I want to say now, uh, like, yeah, you, you now have the skills, you already had the skills, but you weren't really aware of it, that you were Neo, that you have the possibility to alter and make it a good thing, um, to, to defend yourself against the hackers and, uh, yeah, the, the evil uh, uh, people. And um, like I said before, you are really the one, the one who has the context, the one who can change and stop those, uh, well in this case, agents uh, from uh, attacking you, owning you, getting the important information out of your application. You can now stop them, prevent them. Um, so uh, I already said a little bit. Uh, yeah, if you want to get involved, uh, look us uh, up at the OWASP.org uh, site. Uh, you can also go to our website, uh, securebuy.design. And like I said, uh, yeah, it's really a, a, a team effort thing. It's not only, it's not of us, it is for everybody and it's yours. All this information you can use. It's all for free. Uh, use it where you can. Um, and yeah, if you have good feedback or you can say like, hey, I have information. I have knowledge about this section, let me improve. Please do, because yeah, uh, everybody can benefit from it. Uh, to name some uh, in numbers, the project has been downloaded around 70,000 times already since we created it. And it's basically all over the world, international, governments, uh, military, <laughs> all type of businesses, students uh, come by. And, and use this project. Um, so, yeah, it is bigger than ourselves and uh, we would really love to uh, have more contributors and people helping it, making it uh, really awesome. Um, yeah, and like I also said, it's, you know, you, you are as strong as the weakest developer in your team. So be ready and be open to help your fellow developer in your team of people who are developing Give this information to them also. Talk about it like you talk about functionality or about new cool languages you, you programmed in or use the same passion to help others and, and you know, make them also a better person. Like I said, everybody of you have the potential of being the awesome Neo and also the weakest link in your team can be. If you give it enough time, energy, they can also be awesome right um so the last part is uh, questions uh there was a lot of information so maybe an overload on information uh thanks to cooper there will be also a recording so uh you can also watch it back but uh, does somebody uh, have a question or
So that's a good question. Um, so the question is, what is the impact of having all those type of security and controls? Uh, yeah, does it impact performance? I must say, uh, back in the uh, in the 80s, 90s, it would really have impact a lot. Um, it's the same story like people say, yeah, if you use encryption, HTTPS security, it will make your website slower. Well, not anymore, because nowadays all the computer servers have on board uh, uh, crypto chips, especially designed to do the operations and you won't have any uh, performance uh, lose there, right? Um, but indeed, in the, in the beginning stage of uh, the program era, uh, yeah, it would, you would chip in on performance. But it better again, I would like to counter challenge this saying, what do you want, uh, what do you want to achieve? Do you want to have a secure application that's not hackable? Or do you want a hackable application that performs very quickly? I think the attacker would like it, that it performs very quickly and it's hacked. So, but <laughs> I can assure you, uh, nowadays with all the type of functionality and functions available, it will almost nothing in, in the performance hitting. Uh, like the normal functionality. Of course, if you implement something like tar pitting uh, or, or stuff like that, well, then you choose to hit performance because that's the way to slow down the attack. For example, if you use stretching, that's a, a hashing method where you're stretching and that means you don't hash only one time uh, uh, the, yeah, the password in this case, but you do it multiple times. Uh, the whole idea is uh, what now is being think of safe and secure can be in one year not. So you want to stretch, you want to do multiple times of hashing and you want to have it variable. So in a year later, the same application you say, don't do one iteration because that was good one year ago, but now do thousand because the Morrison's law, uh, you know, it, it needs to uh, be uh, increased. So for hashing, there's a specific method that you do want to increase uh, yeah, the performance cost. Otherwise, it would be too easy now to crack a hash back from five or one year ago. Um, so, any other questions? How do you compile the reads? Uh, yeah, very good question. Um, <coughs> so, first we used an, uh, an other checklist. Uh, we thought of, well, we were aware of this checklist uh, and we used that. Till I met Jim Manico, he was the board member uh, of OWASP um, and he did a presentation and I showed him the, the project and he was like, whoa, this is really awesome, only for the post-development phase, why, why don't you use the ASVS? I'm like, ASVS, what? So <laughs> he pointed me to the project and then I looked at it and I was like, whoa, holy, this is the most excessive, full-blown uh, list checklist verification list out there. Um, so yeah, we uh, did a lot of work together uh, and, and implement that checklist into the post development phase and, and swapped it with the, well, older one. Um, and I, I was becoming so enthusiastic about the whole ASVS that I, uh, well, also helped, uh, you know, with the 3.0 version and sit with them and, and helped improve it together. I mean, OWASP is open. Everybody who has good ideas or feedback or knowledge can, can share this together, right? So, uh, and that's exactly what we also did to, to again, yeah, help each other and, and create a really good, uh, yeah, information base uh, that we all can benefit from. So uh, all the credits for the post-development phase <laughs> goes to the ASVS uh, project uh, team that, uh, uh, started it uh, and uh, yeah, I'm re really happy with the uh, yeah the, the security controls in there. Uh, I didn't uh, see or find any list that even come close to it on the uh, public internet. So, any other questions? Future, <coughs> future releases. Future. Oh, future. Uh, New feature. 
the, yeah, that's a good one. Um, we, we do have uh, a couple of things in mind. For example, the possibility to also use the uh, uh, OWASP ZAP uh, tool to kick it off, run it from the uh, uh, security knowledge framework to do already, uh, well, a quick assessment on the dust part, right? Uh, and, and where you can import the uh, results into the security knowledge framework so you have all the, the different type of security quality gates together in one yeah, central place, right? So you can uh, see the pre-development phase, you can see the post-development phase where you did the verification, and you can import the ZOP results so you have it all together to create a really yeah, a good overview, a big picture of the current state uh, of, of the project you created. Um, yeah, like I said, also, uh, we, we're going to uh, working on, on different type of uh, languages, code examples. We want to uh, add more to them to also give guidance on the implementation level, because that's also really important. Um, yeah, and, and uh, we also have uh, on the GitHub a lot of enhancement things. Uh, yeah, so if, if you need something or think like, hey, this would be awesome to, to include, let us know. Uh, today, for example, I got feedback from somebody who said, yeah, it would be awesome if I could have a comment box uh, on the post-development phase. So when I say yes on an item, I can also add a comment saying, because we do it like this, that, and that. Um, or no, we don't do it because, yeah, this. Or So things like that can really uh, help and evolve uh, yeah, the project. Um, so if you have good feedback, please uh, tell us. Any other questions? No? Okay. Thank you all.